Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with South African jazz musician Naduzo Makatini. We had a spirited talk from his base in South Africa about his latest 2020 CD, Modes of Communication, Letters from the Underworlds, and so much more. He grew up in the lush and rugged hillscapes of South Africa, and the church played a big role in his musical understanding. He was also quite swayed by the music of John Coltrane's classic quartet with McCoy Tyner. Along with being a skilled musician, he's also an educator and a researcher as the head of the music department at Fort Hare University in Eastern Cape. His wisdom, enthusiasm, and drive is impressive, and he's got a huge future ahead of him. Enjoy. Hey, man, thank you for taking a minute out for Neon Jazz. Yeah, man, no problem, man. I'm excited about it, yeah. Me too, man. Yeah, I've really enjoyed your music. I've had you on my radar for quite a while, so modes of communication... Yeah, definitely. So, Modes of Communication, Letters from the Underworlds. It's a wonderful album. It comes out during a pandemic and a lot of crazy stuff on the planet. Talk to me a little bit about this release for you. So, yeah, man. I mean, you know, at first it was because I remember just before, like, lockdown was announced, I had just come back from um, a short tour with the Jazz at Lincoln Center. It was in Europe, and I was coming back to South Africa with a plan of leaving like a month later because I was going to be going on a U.S. tour that was planned. And then after that, there was the the European tour. So, I mean, of course, like the first thing that comes to mind was, oh, man, you know, this is this is really bad timing for all of these things, you know, uh, against the backdrop of my release and and my, the album launch that was supposed to be at the at Deezus at the Lincoln Center, so there was dates and everything. So, of course, all of that was not going to happen anymore. So when I realized that, you know, I kind of like just tried adjusting if there is such a thing. You know, like I, I started to think about the themes invoked in the album and what do they mean with regards to the broader you know, climate that was going on around the world, you know, with COVID-19 and people dying, people restricted with regards to movement and all of that. And I realized that in that sense, the album had been prophetic in, in a big way. So if we start with the first song that came out in 2019, November, which was the first single, it's called Elisanu Moya. And the song you know, in a nutshell, speaks about the coming of great sicknesses and the fact that, like, you know, we would need some kind of spiritual intervention in order to deal with such a time. So, you know, when I started thinking deeply about what these songs were saying, I understood why it had to be released in this particular period. And because then in, in many ways it speaks to how, how do we then keep a sense of hope? How do we then produce the, an, an energy that is deliberate in assisting us to deal with the current situation. So in many ways, I realized that it had to be this album. It had to be at this particular moment. So I've accepted everything around it. And needless to say, the album is done well under these circumstances. It's unbelievable how the album has spread and the possibility of online as well and how that has almost amplified what the album would have done perhaps with my own physical presence but the online presence has been reaching even beyond what we had imagined so you know in many ways i think i think everything happens for the right reason somehow you have such a unique yeah. voice on this album how did you how did this sound evolve for you into this particular project yeah so like the, there's a there's a kind of thread like a, a, that runs through all my projects and that is you know it's always informed by a very specific theme that i'm you know i would be currently thinking about and and somehow those themes you know almost put me in, in very specific paradigms within the sonic but also paradigms within my kind of philosophical outlook uh and the way that i'm thinking about sound and I think what, what makes this album have a unique sound is that I was thinking about a very specific notion 
within African spirituality, which is that of citing things from elsewhere. And by elsewhere, I'm referring to the kind of like ancestral realm. So within African spirituality, there's a belief that people don't actually die. They lose the body and they become spirit. So my interest has always been, how do we listen to that spirit? How do we, what are the tools? What are the methods of listening to things that are beyond the body, that are spiritual in essence? And, and so this album came as a response. And I think it's orchestrated in that particular way. I use the notion of a letter as a kind of like sonic letter, uh, things that are said elsewhere. Particularly if you listen to a song like um, Beneath the Earth, Beneath the Earth is something that came through a dream and I, I, when I woke up I was able to remember everything, the melody and, and the orchestration and everything. So in, in many ways I think being attentive to what I call the ancestral voice would always help me to produce unique sounds in, 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 in very particular moments of my journey. Of course, informed like who I bring to the record, you know, like someone like Logan Richardson has, you know, similar thinking about music as a pursuit towards something that is, you know, invisible itself. And, and music, music is a manifestation of these things that happen beyond our bodies. And Logan has a direct link to here to Kansas City, and yeah, his music, yeah, his music is wonderful, and that had to be amazing to work with Logan. Man, it's he's, he's a special musician, you know, a special brother as well to me because, like, you know, we met when we were doing a gig with uh, Nicola Conte. He's like a DJ slash producer and plays guitar, and you know, it was like a kind of commercial gig that we we're doing. So just day before the performance. Uh, Nicola was supposed to do an interview and for some reason he couldn't do an interview so me and Logan went through and did that interview on his behalf and when we got there they asked us to play a song and we were like asking each other what we're gonna play and we ended up playing uh, I Wanna Talk About You which is a call chain song that plays over the changes of Misty which is a, a jazz standard and when we did that after that it was just like, man, we, we have the same aspirations. We are inspired by the same people. And also I told Logan that I've been following the Equality Project, Nashid Waits with um, Jason Moran and, and um, Taurus Matin on bass. So like somehow I, I had known Logan's voice for a while. So, you know, it was just special to come really close. And, you know, we, we, we are planning to do more actually in the future. I was actually supposed to come to Kansas City as part of my tour that I was doing, so of course it never happened. Yeah, that'd be great when you do get here. Let me let me ask you this: growing up, man. yeah, <laughs> yes. So growing up in South Africa, talk to me a little bit about how the roots of jazz got in you and how deep they sure. became. So you know, growing up in South Africa is many things, and 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 many things that I'm grateful for. On the one hand, it, it has a backdrop of inequality similar to the U.S. in the 60s, the civil rights movement. So politically, it has a kind of similar backdrop. And in many ways, if we look at like very specific movements in the 50s, 60s in the U.S. and the music that was coming out, really trying to speak against these problems, confronting these problems, you know, creating possibilities of freedom. So that's a similar way, like, you know, jazz came came to existence in South Africa. So I, it's something that I would actually pick up much later for me, you know, because I only started playing jazz when I was like 18. But one thing that became interesting to me was that like all the other types of like traditional music that I had been involved in growing up, Later on, in retrospect, I realized there was a kind of jazziness in them. And that is really specifically looking at like improvisation and how improvisation acts like a hinge and, and the thing that really informs how jazz moves forward. So my relationship with jazz comes much later, but my relationship with improvisation is something that is anchored on the folk music of Southern Africa. So there's just those connections that are 
have really informed how I, I, I understand this music. What was the first jazz concert you saw live that really moved you? The first jazz concert that I saw, yeah, I think I remember this one vividly. It was in um, South Africa in Durban, and I saw a pianist that you might know called Begim Seleg. He was a South African pianist that um, went to exile in the 80s and um, had quite a, a difficult career. And he worked with A.P. Lincoln, he worked with um, Elvin Jones, he, he worked with Farrah Sanders and everyone. And post-94 in South Africa, 94 was like the democratic elections in South Africa, the first ones. He came down here and I got to meet him and he, he happened to be like my mentor over many years. And the first year's performance that I saw that moved me was his performance when he was playing the music that he had recorded in the U.S. and in, in, in London. And man, it was surreal because... Before him, I, I've always known this kind of sound from records. So it was surreal just to see someone actually play like that, you know, and I, I would never forget that. It really, it changed how I was thinking about music. It changed also my conception of what jazz music was about. The church played a big role in your life growing up, and also there is a very specific mention of John Coltrane and McCoy Tyner. Talk to me a little bit first about how important the church was in, in your understanding of music and developing that music that led to your love of Coltrane and beyond. Yeah. So, you know, of course, when we think about Coltrane, we're thinking about, you know, the Baptist church and, you know, various forms of church. But I want to frame this in a different way that, like, when we're thinking about black church, we are not particularly referring to a building or a set of doctrines that inform a particular religious belief system, but we are actually uh, referring to all different types of congregation or all different types of gatherings that are informed by spiritual purpose. And that expands the notion of a church in that regard when we think about like my connection with the church. But there are specific uh, kind of like religious movements that I was following. One of those was something called the Zionist Church here in South Africa uh, and the Shembe Church. And part of these church were also like in many ways the refusal during uh, colonization to say, you know, when they were introducing Christianity, there was a kind of hybridization that was connecting the, um, the ancient belief systems of the people in pre-colonial modes and speaking and having a, a dialogue with Christianity. And when I, of course, um, encountered culture and it was at the music library in school, I just looked at the, the liner notes and, and, and culture has this prayer, you know? And that was like the first instance for me where I was like, man, it's the first time I, I hear jazz musicians speak like this because he had written the liner notes himself and it was basically a prayer. So from there, I was interested in him, and I, of course, I listened to A Love Supreme, and my life has never been the same since then, you know? Because in the introduction to sound from a, a cultural standpoint, for me, was a, all sound was always a passageway, was always a bridge leading to something else. And this is I, what I felt when I listened to Call Chain. It felt like he was engaging sound with a, a, a very deep, kind of seeking mode to things that were spiritual. And so is McCoy Tyner, although McCoy Tyner was not very explicit about this in many interviews, but he, he was someone who was spiritual and part of the people that, you know, uh, uh, you know, had um, this transition spiritually in the 60s as well, where they were changing their names and stuff. That's when he changed to Suleiman Saud. So, like, you know, I think spirituality is a big hinge that connects Coltrane with the continent. And I think Coltrane was also looking at pre-slavery histories and trying to connect with ancestry that was in the continent. And we see this a lot in Coltrane's uh, discography when he was recording albums such as Kuruse Mama and incorporating African instruments. 
African musicians and, and like trying to chase home in those in that kind of sense. And of course, with Elvin Jones, it's obvious as well, Jimmy Garrison. So there's a sense in which for many jazz musicians in South Africa, the introduction is Coltrane because he's already kind of speaking to a kind of folk sound here in South Africa. You know, so those were really the connections. So there's clearly an exuberance with how you approach music, your sound, and even talking to you, I can tell. My question to you yeah. is this. What's the best thing about waking up every day knowing you're a professional musician? The, the thing about it for me, what makes it exciting and special is that I, I didn't have a moment where I was deciding I was going to be a musician. And like I said before, so sound for me was introduced within the context of ritual and ceremony. So I understand sound to, to be a way of being. So before it becomes professional, before it becomes a career, it's something that I would do anyway. So I kind of feel like, you know, I wake up within a broader, you know, idea, an ontological idea of being. So sound is situated right in that. So I do not know any other way I could leave, you know. <laughs> so it's like, kind of, I don't have a choice. <laughs> Wonderful. The, the other part of you that's very defined is that you have an educational component. And yeah. you're, you're an educator and a researcher, the head of the Department of Music. Yeah. Talk to me a little sure. bit about what you've learned from musicians over the years. You know, sure. really, like, deep musicians that have been around for a while that have helped you be a better teacher sure. oh man thank you for that because you know like one of the key principles in african cosmology is this notion of the past so the notion of time in africa is such that the past continues to live with us so your question in that sense about the people that have inspired me those people are actually are the people that are now my ancestors and they inform a broader understanding of being in the world. You know, I, I, I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for people like Begum Selegu that I mentioned, who is actually the very first person that put these connections to context for me. And also, I was, I've been touring for many years with uh, a saxophone player called Zim Ngawana. Zim Ngawana studied with Max Raj and he, he was a saxophone player uh, heavily into the kind of Sandra school and the, and the broader AACM movement in the US that was really about like the commune as a space for learning. So the communal as this safe space where people could learn and grow. So part of what I learned is that it's impossible to do this without a community. So in a sense, we learn and we become products of a community. And this is something that I take with me into the academia in my teaching approach, in a sense that like everything becomes communal, it's informed by, you know, the broader context of a community. So we're learning to be better uh, players within the broader community. So we're not only just learning music, but we're learning to be better contributors within a healthy society. So we're learning to be better fathers, better husbands, better... So in a way, it's it's a totality that I've learned from these musicians, that being a musician is also a way of being. So this is what I take forward. As the world starts to wake up a little bit from COVID and live music begins and vaccinations are spreading, what do you hope we realize about the power of live music when we all get back to it? Man, the, the power of live music is going to be particularly understood in this moment because now we would have known what it is to live without live music and i think it's something that perhaps humanity has taken for granted for many years because it's you know human beings anything that we have access to we end up not really respecting and i think uh, there was too much access to live music such that people did not quite think through what the role of live music was in their lives you know in the broader scheme of existence um, and i think when things open up they, they, there is gonna be a deep sense of understanding the role of music in society outside of the realm of entertainment 
because in the past it was understood as something that I could just go to entertain myself. But I think now there is a, a deeper need for music, and there is even a, 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 a distinct need for uh, spiritual music. So I think going forward, the music will sit in a different register when we think about. You know, society. So, it, musicians now sit in a position clearly as healers, as thinkers, as, as people that kind of like foreseeing the future, as prophets, as diviners, as um, you know, as griots. You know, as 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 it were in West Africa, for instance. So, I think if anything, the role of an artist will be crystallized, and I think there is going to be a lot of gatherings, and you know, people. Respecting this and 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 again feeling like it's 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 really something important. So everyone has their idea of who they think you are, a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, your students. But yeah. you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? You've asked many difficult questions, except this is the most difficult one. <laughs> and and I save this one for the last. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know. The honest truth is I don't have an answer to this question, but I do have a, 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 you know, a kind of, I can formulate an answer responding to who I would like to be. Uh, because maybe I'm not that person yet, but if I were to wish, uh, you know, to be a, a particular person, I would, I would really be that person that opens up to a, a level of surrender. You know, this is something that I try to practice. And and if my kids would remember me as someone who surrendered to a broader uh, planetary, a cosmic work, and I think this is how I would like to be known. So if if you think of me as an improviser, I would like to be that intro improviser that has contributed in those dimensions, you know, just a total surrender and a deep listening to the universe and surrounding and what is happening and, and, and always being in tune as Sandra, you know, reminds us about like, you know, this idea of really being in tune with the cosmos, being a nice person in essence, <laughs> yeah. being nice to, 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 to surrounding, you know, being, being friendly, being, you know, being accepting of many things as well. Beautiful. I love that answer, yeah. man. This has been so refreshing, Thank man. <laughs> Thank you for reaching back out to me. I, I, I'm so glad you did. And we'd love to see you in Kansas City. Good luck with everything, the album and the return to the stage. Oh, man, I'm so thankful for this interview and, and, and you allowing me to share these ideas. Oh. And say, man, I appreciate it and blessings to you. And I'm definitely going to be in Kansas City soon. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in South Africa, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com and for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the Neon jazz.blogspot.com until next time enjoy the jazz my friends neon jazz